The Mysticism of John Piper At Passion 2020, John Piper's Address Live for your greatest desire, Jesus, illustrates the central role that desire plays in his ministry. He mentions the word over 90 times, concluding with the idea that the awakening of a supreme desire in God opens the pathway to the new birth. It's a desire for God. You're still making so much of your desire. You're going to make a God out of desire, Piper. You make a God out of desire with all this focus and emphasis upon desire. To be born again is to taste that God is more to be desired than anything. That's what it means to be born again. The creation of a desire for God greater than the desire for anything else is to be a Christian. Let's pray together. Father, I ask now that the miracle of the new birth, the miracle of the awakening of a supreme desire for Jesus above all things, would be granted to thousands. In line with his opening prayer, Piper said the awakening of a supreme desire for Jesus is what it means to be born again and to become a Christian. God offers himself in this stadium right now. He offers himself to us as the infinitely valuable, infinitely beautiful, all-satisfying treasure of the universe for your full and everlasting pleasure. The concept of a supreme desire for God is an inner subjective emotion which lies at the heart of Piper's message. Piper uses the term awakening, a word strongly associated with Eastern religion and New Age thinking, to describe the new birth. Desire is central to Buddhist teaching. All phenomena, the Buddha once said, are rooted in desire. Everything we think, say or do, every experience comes from desire. Even we come from desire. We were reborn into this life because of our desire to be. The path that takes you to Nirvana is rooted in desire, in skillful desires. Basic to everyone is the desire for happiness. The Buddha imagined the ultimate happiness, one so free from limit and lack that it would leave no need for further desire, and then treasured his desire for that happiness as his highest priority. The noble truths of Buddhism give two roles to desire, depending on whether it's skillful or not. Unskillful desire is the cause of suffering. Skillful desire undercuts unskillful desire, not by repressing it, but by producing greater and greater levels of satisfaction and well-being so the unskillful desire has no place to stand. The desires the Buddha recommends really do produce a happiness that can give you the strength to keep on choosing the skillful path. Sadhguru, a Hindu mystic with a worldwide ministry, refers to desire as a wonderful vehicle for making contact with the ultimate. As a mystic, he teaches that the third eye, the gateway to the inner realms of higher consciousness, opens the pathway to mystical experiences. Sadhguru designed the massive Adi Yoga statue of the Hindu god Shiva. At 112 feet, it is the largest statue in the world. 
there is something within you longing to be little more than what you are right now. That is desire. So your desire's ultimate goal is unboundedness, the infinite nature. Desire is a wonderful vehicle which will take you places. Even if you want to reach the ultimate, you need a desire. Anyway, the desire in you is longing for un unboundedness, it is longing for unlimitedness, it is longing for the ultimate nature. If you bring awareness to your desiring process, it is a wonderful instrument. So we see that in the teachings of John Piper, the Buddha and the Guru, desire plays a central role. Piper teaches that the awakening of a supreme desire for Jesus is what it means to be born again. The Buddha teaches that skillful desire produces happiness and strength to choose the skillful path. The Guru teaches that desire is a wonderful vehicle for reaching the ultimate. New Age teaches that a divine spark which burns in every man is indicative of man's potential to be one with the universal life force. This unity is achieved by an awakening of the light within. The mission of New Age is to share light and love with others on the planet, empowering them toward their spiritual awakening. The purpose of this video is to show that mysticism is an essential element of John Piper's philosophy of Christian hedonism. Encyclopedia Britannica defines mysticism as the sense of some form of contact with the divine or transcendent, frequently understood in its higher forms as involving union with God. In his book, Faith Misguided, Exposing the Dangers of Mysticism, Professor Arthur Johnson shows how many truths of scripture are being distorted by the philosophy of mysticism, which places experience and emotion above the inerrant word of God. Unfortunately, the misunderstandings spawned by mysticism have gained respectability among the evangelical community. Johnson says that some evangelical Christians look with favor on forms of mysticism that are dangerous. When we speak of a mystical experience, we refer to an event that is completely within the person. It is totally subjective. It is this claim that mystical experiences are ways of knowing truth that is vital to understanding many religious movements we see today. One such religious movement of our day is John Piper's Desiring God Ministry that propagates the philosophy of Christian hedonism. In his best-selling book, Desiring God, published in 1986, with many subsequent editions, Piper teaches that the ultimate ground of Christian hedonism is the fact that God is uppermost in his own affections. The chief end of God is to glorify God and enjoy himself forever. Piper paints a picture of a God whose chief attribute is happiness and whose chief end is to enjoy himself. In other words, Piper's God is a committed hedonist. This is a false view of the God of the Bible, who is holy and righteous, and gracious and compassionate. Johnson contends that the mystical experience which is totally within a person has an emotional tone and a life-changing intensity. A Christian mystic equates his inner feelings with the voice of God. He claims to have experienced God and to receive special revelations. He tends to believe that the activity of the Holy Spirit within 
is expressed primarily through emotions. This may take the form of a feeling of union with God. Some mystics, like Piper, claim, as we see in this video, that God has revealed himself directly to them. They have heard the voice of God speaking personally to them. Johnson writes, Mysticism, as I have defined it, has as its essential element a certain deep trust in inner, subjective feeling states, which are seen as both good and valuable in themselves, and as truth-bearing. I have also argued that the Christian should reject mystical experiences because God has chosen to relate to man by means of man's mind, not through his emotions. To be a mystic is itself an open door to false doctrine. As a young man, Piper was awakened to the truth of Christian hedonism by his mentor, Blaise Pascal. When he discovered his truth, that God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him, Piper says he was freed from the unbiblical bondage of fear that it is wrong to pursue joy. His overwhelming quest for happiness was not just permitted, but required. He writes, This was almost too good to be true, that my quest for joy and my duty to glorify God were not in conflict. Indeed, God's divine happiness is the fountain from which the Christian hedonist drinks and longs to drink more deeply. The aim of the Christian hedonist is to be happy in God. To drink at the fountain of divine happiness is a mystical experience. Mysticism is an essential element of Christian hedonism, which claims to provide a way into the secret of everlasting pleasure in God. The force of Piper's mystical awakening is so overwhelming and so deeply emotional that it changed his entire life. All those years I had been trying to suppress my tremendous longing for happiness, but now it started to dawn on me that this persistent and undeniable yearning for happiness was not to be suppressed, but glutted on God. With the idea of Christian hedonism firmly implanted in his mind, Piper turned to the Psalms and says he found the language of hedonism everywhere. I have been trying to understand it and live it and teach it ever since. It's not new. It's been there for a thousand years. I thank God today for Pascal's part in my awakening. But Piper has committed a cardinal error by starting with the wisdom of men and not with scripture. He is reading the word of God through the lens of Christian hedonism, searching for verses taken out of context that can be made to support his hedonistic philosophy. If he had started with scripture, there would be no such thing as Christian hedonism. In his article, Have You Tasted God Himself? Piper thanks God that for over 60 years he has awakened and reawakened countless times the taste for the moral beauty of divine things. Piper's awakened taste for divine moral beauty is a completely subjective experience. Christian hedonism is based on Piper's subjective inner belief that the purpose of the Christian life is to achieve maximum happiness in God. The ruling force in Piper's awakened ministry is Christian mysticism. Piper writes in Desiring God, I thank God that again and again He has awakened my heart to desire Him, to see Him, and to sit down at the feast of Christian hedonism 
and worship the King of Glory. In his mystical thinking, Piper imagines himself sitting down to a heavenly hedonistic feast. In his book, Hunger for God, Desiring God through fasting and prayer, Piper writes, There is an appetite for God, and it can be awakened. I invite you to turn from the dulling effects of food and the dangers of idolatry and to say with some simple fast, This much, O oh God, I want you. But scripture denies any appetite for God to be awakened in man. The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Indeed, the natural man suppresses the truth of God in his unrighteousness, with the wrath of God over him because of his sin. And no one seeks after God, no, not one. So Piper is outside of Scripture in describing man as having an appetite for God. In When I Don't Desire God, How to Fight for Joy, Piper writes, Now I am finding evidence all over the Bible that the pursuit of joy in God and the awakening of all kinds of spiritual affections are part of the essence of the newborn Christian heart. It is the awakening of a new taste for spiritual reality centering in Christ. The word centering is common in New Age meditation. Centering practices are intended to disengage the mind from the normal waking state, taking it into a state of deep relaxation. Centering meditation helps connect to the inner life. Piper writes, Our chief end is to glorify God, the great object. We do so most fully when we treasure him, desire him, delight in him. But the Bible speaks about glorifying God in a vastly different way. Jesus taught that God is glorified by the good works of his disciples. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Our Lord also said that God is glorified by the fruitfulness of his disciples. Yain is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Paul prayed that the Philippian church might be filled with the fruit of righteousness, which comes through Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. In Desiring God, Piper says, We are converted when Christ becomes for us a treasure chest of holy joy. So the faith that pleases God is the assurance that when we turn to Him, we will find the all-satisfying treasure. We will find our heart's eternal delight. Piper's awakening to the truths of Christian hedonism revealed to him that God is an everlasting treasure the source of eternal joy. To access the source, we need to cultivate a taste for the beauty of God. We need a new spirituality centering in Christ, which enables us to turn the spark of our supreme desire into a flame of everlasting pleasure. Piper's mystical language of all-satisfying treasure, our heart's eternal delight, supreme desire, tasteful beauty, centering, awakening, and everlasting pleasure is not useful for teaching the gospel of God. Piper emphasizes the importance of emotions in worship. He writes, The engagement of the heart in worship is the coming alive of the feelings and emotions and affections of the heart, where feelings for God are dead, worship is dead. True worship must include inward feelings that reflect the worth of God's glory. According to Piper, worship is authentic when affections for God arise in the heart, in the moment of authentic emotion. 
we are transported, perhaps only for seconds, above the reasoning work of the mind, and we experience feeling without reference to logic or practical implications. Piper has described a mystical experience in which God's presence stands above the reasoning work of the mind. According to Jesus, true worship must be in keeping with God's nature. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. In Dangerous Duty of Delight, Piper again emphasizes the importance of emotion and feelings. Christian hedonism claims that emotions are commanded throughout the Bible. Therefore, Christian hedonism is not making too much of emotion when it says that being satisfied in God is our calling and duty. Piper's mystical approach to worship is based on authentic emotion and of being transported into the presence of Piper's pleasure-giving false God. But the true God of the Bible has chosen to relate to man by means of his mind, not through his emotions. God has put his law into the mind of men. Believers are exhorted to know the mind of Christ. Just as human beings can make the thoughts of their mind known to others by speech and writing, so God has communicated his thoughts to men and women in Scripture. Come now, let us reason together says the Lord. The repudiation of mysticism is not the denial of proper emotions. Instead, it is the assertion that reason, not emotion, is the tool for grasping and testing truth. We learn much about John Piper from his ministry to the annual Passion Conference. Over a number of years, he has preached the Keynote Passion Address to many thousands of young people. Working with Louis Giglio, Piper has helped turn Passion into a worldwide movement. Piper is completely given over to Passion's worship culture. Passion worship is generated by the skillful use of psychedelic strobe lighting. In a darkened auditorium packed with young people, eagerly anticipating an ecstatic rave experience, thunderous rhythmic rock music produces a mass of swirling bodies and waving arms. Added to the mix is the name of Jesus, and young people are led to believe that they are worshipping the God of the Bible. But they have been deceived. What we see at passion is counterfeit worship. And the terrible truth is that most of the young people at passion actually believe that they can worship God in this way. We must conclude that the spirit of passion is not the spirit of God. The ecstatic excitement of passion revelers induces a state of altered consciousness that facilitates a mystical union with the divine. Yet Piper is effusive in his praise of passion worship. One of the things I love about passion is passion celebrates a majestic, holy, glorious, just, beautiful God and his Son by the Spirit. And then it works its way out in the lyrics of the songs. The passion experience is deeply mystical and provides the ideal setting for Piper to propagate his dogma of Christian hedonism. The heresy of Piper is that he presents a false hedonistic God created in his own image, a God whose central aim is to satisfy the desires of men by offering them the hope of everlasting pleasure in God. This is a false gospel, and Piper reveals himself to be a false teacher. 
The final evidence of Piper's mysticism is his claim to have heard the voice of God. Johnson says, The religious mystic claims to have experienced God and to have received special revelations. In his article, The Morning I Heard the Voice of God, Piper says, The God of the Universe spoke to him. Let me tell you about the most wonderful experience I had early Monday morning, March 19, 2007, a little after 6 o'clock. God actually spoke to me. There's no doubt it was, the, it was God. I heard the words in my head just as clearly as when a memory of a conversation passes across your consciousness. The words were in English, but they had about them the absolutely self-authenticating ring of truth. As I prayed and mused, suddenly it happened. God said, come and see what I have done. There was no, not the slightest doubt in my mind that these were the very words of God. He had something to say to me. I wondered what he meant by come and see. Would he take me somewhere like he did Paul into heaven to see uh, what can't be spoken? Did see mean that I would have a vision of some great deed of God that no one has seen? The God of the universe was speaking to me. Then he said, I am awesome in my deeds toward the children of man. God himself was narrating the mighty works of God. He was doing it for me. Consistent with his mystical approach, Piper imagined that perhaps God would take him into heaven to see things that cannot be spoken of. Or perhaps he would see a vision of some great deed of God seen by no other person. Piper is relating an ecstatic mystical experience which confirms his commitment to the way of Christian mysticism. But in the Gospel age, God does not speak audibly to mankind, as Piper claims. God speaks through Scripture, the written word of God. Piper is elevating himself to appear as a deeply spiritual man, a modern-day prophet authenticated by God speaking to him personally. We need to understand that Piper's Christian hedonism is a deeply mystical heretical dogma that stands in opposition to the authentic Christian faith. His statement that to be born again is to awaken a supreme desire for God is deeply mystical. Evangelical Christians are bound by scripture. Thy word is truth. Mysticism, on the other hand, provides a way of knowing God which is outside scripture. Johnson writes, Thus the mystic uses his experience to determine the meaning of scripture, instead of using scripture to judge his experience. As a result, Mystical experience is a constant source of false doctrine. Mysticism must be rejected because of its constant threat to sound biblical theology and the true gospel of Christ. Piper's emphasis on emotions and subjective feelings is not true worship of God, but counterfeit worship based in mysticism. Piper's claim to hear the voice of God is a mystical delusion. Evangelical Christians are exhorted to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. This means taking a stand against Piper's mystical Christian hedonism.